Good to be here tonight. Thankful for the opportunity uh, to preach. And uh, just love the Lord. I, if y'all haven't seen it in the bulletin, Jessica and I, the Lord saw fit to give us another child. So pray for her. She's having a little bit of a rough time with her uh, blood clotting medicine that she has to take. And uh, uh, nothing serious. It's just quite painful to get injections every day in the same small area. So just pray for her that the Lord will give her strength and, uh, and patience to deal with this. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. This is not my primary text, but I, I find that I can't help but preface my messages uh, here lately with this when I'm reading out of the Old Testament. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I pray, Lord, that you'd help me now, that you'd anoint my lips of clay. God, that you'd fill me with your Spirit, give me unction from on high. Lord, let it not be me standing up here, but me be a mouthpiece for the glory of God. I praise you now. I ask this in Christ's blessed name. Amen. You may be seated. Romans 15, 4 here tells us, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And, and it says that uh, we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope in this. Uh, so whenever we look back into the Old Testament, we ought to recognize that these things are... There is a testimony for us so that we can see uh, examples of what's going on in, even in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, there's so many times that you might hear a preacher preach something that's written out of the book of Job, and it's written so many thousands of years ago, but it hits home. It really hits home. And I hope that's what this message does this evening for you. In the book of 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 20 is where I'll be starting out. 1 Chronicles chapter 20. It says, And it came to pass that after the year was expired, at the time that the kings go out to battle, Joab led forth the power of the army and wasted the country of the children of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried at Jerusalem, and Joab smote Rabbah and destroyed it. And if you look in chapter 21 and verse 1, it says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, just to say something about this, I want to let you know, first of all, I really love typology. I think typology is, is so key and so important, but you can't get wrapped up in something being perfect. But I love typology. You have everything from David defeating the Goliath as a type of Christ defeating death. According to Hebrews 2 and verse 9, it says, He by the grace of God tasted death for every man, that's the whosoever. And verse 14 says he took, uh, he took part of the same, meaning that he took upon uh, him the likeness of sinful flesh that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You see, the death on the cross laid the foundation that made salvation through the blood of Christ available to all men. In 1 Samuel 1 and uh, 1 Samuel 17, we see David using a method approved by himself to bring down the champion of the Philistines. David was, had the armor of Saul given to him, and he said, here you go, you can use this. And David said, I haven't proved this. This isn't going to work for me. So he took something that he had proved, and he, and he stood before the champion of the Philistines. Likewise, Christ, Christ used a method that was approved of God in Genesis where blood was shed, to cover Adam and Eve's sin, to, to, to clothe their wickedness, and blood was shed. And Christ, following this type, offered up himself. Hebrews 9.11 says, uh, Christ became the high priest. And verse 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us all. So types really bring out something there. You can see that, that they, they really make certain, certain things accessible to your mind and and giving you an example. And these things, as, as, as Paul wrote in Romans, are written aforetime for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And I'm going to talk about something here with uh, David. And it seems that the Lord's had me on David here for a little while uh, preaching about him as I've had opportunities to preach other places. It says here again in chapter 21 and verse 1, And Satan stood up against Israel, 1 Chronicles 
and provoke David to number Israel. You know, it's, it, it seems so often that we get provoked ourselves. And I'm going to draw out the, the trial that's set before us here. The trial that's set before David here, it's twofold in that it would, re, in that it would reveal the problem of pride within the heart of David. It would not only do that, it would also bring judgment to obedience unto Israel. And however temporary that judgment may be, uh, or that, that obedience may be, it was brought unto Israel through this action here. And he says in verse 2, And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, the, And uh, the Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth the Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? And I want to say here that David is a type. He's standing here as a type of the believer who has set out to sin. David here has, has said in his heart, he said that this is something that I desire. This is something that I want. I want to number Israel. And, and it's from the pride of his heart that that comes forth. It's not something that God desired of David. It's not something that everybody else wanted to know, that not everybody else was interested. And this may seem harmless, and it may seem like something that's just, uh, just, just something so uh, minuscule, minuscule, but it's still something that God didn't want done. And I tell you that there are things that might seem minuscule to us, uh, but there are things that God doesn't want done, and we go ahead and do it anyways in the pride of our own flesh. And I want to say that that's a very dangerous thing. David here goes forth in the pride of his own flesh, and he says, I'm going to number Israel. And Joab here, he says in the latter part of verse 3, why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Talking to David, I see Joab here as a type of the Holy Spirit. Just sitting there saying, is it, right before that sin is conceived and bringeth forth death, he's saying, why are you going to do this? What's brought you to this position here? What, what's made you think in your head that it would be an okay thing for you to do this? You know, God can number Israel as great as he wants. He can bring their numbers up uh, even far above what you can count. But David goes ahead in verse 4, says, Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab, wherefore Joab departed. And went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. So David refuses to heed the warning. And as a result suffers the consequences. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation... Also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. See, Joab here standing as a type of the Holy Spirit is that, that thing that says, you know what, I'm going to give you an opportunity to bear this so that you can, you can escape from this temptation that is set before you to do this thing that has come up out of pride in your heart. And I think so often we have those, those moments where those moments of escape are set right before us and we just we kind of ignore it. And like David, we are the believer that's set out to sin. You know, sometimes men, you might be standing there or sitting there on your telephone or on your computer and that, that web page is sitting there trying to load and you're trying to look at something you shouldn't be looking at and, and it freezes up and it cancels out and you're ready to hit the recycle button. That right there is your chance of escape from that sin. Or maybe, ladies, you're sitting there and you're, you're ready to gossip and, and you're ready to say, you know, I, I, I got something on my mind about this person. Uh, they've been messing up real bad and men are uh, definitely guilty of this too uh, and, and that name that's that you're trying to pull out it just it, it won't come to your mind that's your chance of escape to say you know what let's talk about better things let's move on to better things let's let's look upon heavenly things and not not things that that will beset us in sin David is given a way of escape here but he proceeds in his pride he proceeds and he says, I'm, I want to do what I want. In James 1 and chapter 14 and, and uh, James 1, sorry, in verse 14 and 15 says here, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and entice. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. 
We see a literal application of this here. David has sinned against the God of Israel. He has said, I'm going to set out to do what I want to do. And you know what? There are some things that have happened that, that might put him in a position where his flesh has been bolstered up to say, you know what? I, I, God, you haven't been too good to me here lately because you, you've allowed me to do this and that. And maybe he's thinking in his heart that he's blaming God. He's saying, you know, well, you, you allowed me to see uh, Uriah's wife. You, you allowed that to happen, God. Why'd you, why'd you let me do that? You know I'm not strong enough. Maybe, maybe he looks back as verse, chapter 19 tells us where uh, the children of Ammon, uh, Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon died and his son reigned and is said. And where David sends out in kindness, uh, he sends out comforters to him and, and he sends them back with their beard shaved and with their, their garments cut and, and sends them back in a shameful manner. He's saying, God, why'd you allow that to happen? You know, oftentimes we can get in a position where we say, God, you, you've allowed me to fall so many times into these, into these weary positions, into these circumstances that, that have brought pain and suffering and hurt in my spiritual life, in my physical life, in, in the relationship with my, my wife or my husband. God, why, why have you abandoned me? And that's when we get a spirit like David had here where he's, he's just ready to be disobedient. He's pushing forward to sin. Right. We'll skip down a few verses. In verse 7 it says, And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. The fulfillment of what James 1, uh, verse 14 and 15 said, that sin when it is conceived bringeth forth death. Verse 8, And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly. And, and in my head, I can, I can hear it and play it out. And, and it sounds like he's saying it like, Well, you know, I've sinned God greatly. And forgive me. It's like when we come down to the altar, we've, we've just been... Uh, we just had this besetting sin or this, this new thing that's come up in our life and we, and we bring it before God and we're not really serious about it. We're just saying, you know, God, I, I need your help. And then and, and, and the, the second and the third time you come before him, the 15th, 20th, 30th time, and you're sitting there saying, oh, God, you know, I really need help. I really need help because we haven't seen the consequences of our sin. But I tell you, it's far better to avoid the consequences here and to follow the Spirit is it guides you to say, God, I repent of what I've done, and I need you to restore me. But David presses on in his sin. He says, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Verse 10, God, uh, using Gad the seer, says, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them that I may do it unto thee. Here comes the punishment. Here comes the punishment that bursts forth from the, uh, the displeasure of God for this wicked thing that David had done. And you say, well, he just numbered the people. It's not that big of a deal, but it's sin in God's eyes, and therefore it is wicked and unholy. It says, go and tell David... These three things are what you can choose from. Verse 13, either three years of famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David, I believe here, he's said in his heart, he's like, oh, God's serious. He's real serious about doing what he wants. And he, he says unto Gad, he says, I am in a great strait. I, I'm, I'm pressed. I, I, I'm pressed upon all sides. This thing is it's overtaken me. It, it, it's driven me together, and I'm altogether uh, uh, weary about the situation. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of men. Verse 15, And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it, and as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed it, It is enough. After 70,000 men, verse 14 tells us, had been slain, 
the consequences of David's sin. I tell you what, there are consequences to our sin. And oftentimes, like here, it affects people around us. Maybe, we're, uh, maybe we've got uh, a good Christian walk and we're a good testimony to those around us. And we fall and we say, you know what, I'm not ready to go back to the Lord. Uh, his chastening is, is, is not enough to drive me to my knees and say, God, forgive me. I, I'm, just, I, I'm mad. I'm going to quench the spirit. I'm going I'm to push away. And people in your life see that. And they see that. And I wonder how many people you could touch. How many people you could touch with the testimony. How many people I could touch with the testimony when I'm, when I'm driving God away from me. When I'm pushing away. When I'm saying, you know, I'm going to go off and do my own thing, Lord. How many people could I touch with the testimony, with the gospel. Yet because I've pushed away. Those people won't be touched by the gospel, not, not for me at least, not in that circumstance. Now David has seen what has come, the judgment. Continuing in verse 15, God said, It is enough, stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan in the Jebusite. David lifted up his eyes, and I think this is that moment when we come to the altar, when we, when we get on our knees in our prayer closet, when, when, we ha when it's dusty and we haven't been there in a while, when, when we pick up our Bible and it's dusty and maybe it's sat in the car on Sundays and we've sometimes brought it in and we've had a bad attitude about being at church or, or we've, had a, we've had an attitude that's not even led us to go to church and, and, and maybe we're at that point where God really shows us the, the consequences for our sin, maybe literally or maybe spiritually. Uh, Spiritually, we've seen some defeats in our life. And you have that moment where you say, you lift up your eyes. Where you lift up your eyes, you see the judgment of God that's falling now. You see the people in your life that, that you had been witnessing to and that you had been testifying of God's grace in your life. And then you see them mock you as you did like Lot and you just went off and did your own thing. You vexed your righteous soul. David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand before the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. You know, there's a time in our life, uh, most often for Christians, where you just have to get on your face over something. Where there's nothing else that you can do but get down on your knees and get down on your face and cry out to God and say, Lord, help me. I've, I've, I've set myself in a place where I can no longer stand. David is in this place. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I is it that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? David here, he says, I, I'm no longer going to, going to just ask the Lord for uh, tacit forgiveness of something, but I'm really going to cry out and I'm going to seek Him uh, for, for a, a reconnection of that bond that I'm trying to break, but the Holy Spirit keeps convicting me of my sins. That chastisement for the believer. No types are perfect, but I see that here in David. And then I see something else. I see, I see a picture of one that David should have looked forward to. You jump down to verse 22. Then David said to Ornan, after God had commanded him to go and, and, and purchase the threshing floor and, and take that and build an altar there, then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the people. Let me go back to verse 20. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. Ornan here is a picture of the Christian who has said, I'm not, I'm not going to succumb to the sins of my flesh. I'm going to keep my body in subjection. Ornan is a type of the believer here who's standing upon the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Ornan is the type of believer who, here who says that, that everything around me is falling apart. There's judgment, there's condemnation, there's hellfire, there's brimstone. Everything is crushing down around me, but I'm going to stand here and continue threshing this wheat. 
And threshing wheat is not an easy thing. If you see how they did it in those days, it was a very difficult and arduous task. He said, all this is happening around me, but I'm just going to continue with what the Lord would have me to do. He says, I'm not going to go with everybody else and run in trembling and fear. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to continue with what God has, has, has asked me to continue in. Then David said to Orn, grant me the place of this threshing floor. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee. Let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. He not only just, he, he didn't say, I've got to go and pray about it, God. I, I've got to go and, 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 and seek some wisdom from an elder brother. I've got to go and ask my pastor. He, he said, I, I see this is the, the thing that needs to be done, and I'm going to do it. This is the situation we're in. I can see the judgment falling upon, uh, upon the people of Jerusalem. And I know that this, this man has come forth, the king, uh, David, has come forth and he's asked for this thing, saying that the Lord has desired it. And he says, I recognize the need here. Uh, take it to thee. Not only says take it to thee, but he says, do that which is good in thy sight, in thine eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings and the threshing instruments for food, for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. Ornan is a type of that believer who says, I surrender all. He says, I submit everything that I've got to you, Lord. He says, I, I know that there are plenty of things here that I, that I could keep on my own, but, but God, I just give it all to you. That we would be surrendered like that. That we would have the compassion in our heart to see the lost around us and say, I'm stirred in my heart that I should go forth. You know, times are only getting worse. It's not getting better. 2008, Pastor Lawson preached a sermon. Preached a sermon. I was listening to it today online. At work, and it just says, I listen to sermons daily and, and, and seek wisdom out of the scriptures from uh, the blessed men of God who stand in the pulpits and, and deliver it. And I saw something there. I, I, I saw a comment down in the section there, and it was talking about, you know, this was in 2008. And look at all the stuff that he said that's come true. Look at all of it, talking about the sodomite agenda. Talking about the, the permiscuity of the nation that, that was pressing forward as we see a mayor in Texas who says, in Texas of all places, who says, well, everybody can go in whatever bathroom they want. In 2008, when Barack Obama, the president of the United States, was voting against same-sex marriage, Yet now we see the direction that our country has gone in. We see the direction where we're pushing ourselves away from Israel. We see the direction where we're pushing ourselves away from the King James Bible. We see ourselves in where we're pushing away from the direction of, of the Holy Spirit as a church. Even those that are truly converted are, are finding themselves in places where they're worshiping man and not God. They're worshiping the, the worship leader for, for how talented he is. And not God. But Ornan continues on threshing. And when the king comes to him and the king says, Hey, you know, i got to take this so that I can make a way. So that I can make a way for salvation. He says, take it. And take all this too. Take all the instruments too. Take the meat. Take it all. I give it all. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price. And I see a picture of Christ here. He didn't come here and say, You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on the cross and I'm going to bear most of your sins so that you can work your way onto heaven after grace is you know, given its part. 
He didn't say, well, work your way and then, and then what you don't get, I'll make up for with grace. No, that's not the order in which he said it. He said, here's grace. Here's your worthlessness. Now go to grace. And I'm glad that he paid the full price because I can tell you today that assuredly none of us could make up for what would have been lacking in that. There's not something that I can do in my flesh that would be pleasing unto God without the Holy Spirit. I can't stand up here and preach in my flesh and it be pleasing to God except the Holy Spirit be in it. We see David, as I said, as a type of the believer that set out to sin. But we see the restoration through him pleading to God and, and saying, God, what do I need to do to get back to my position? And I'm glad that First John says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm glad that this type isn't perfect because it's not something that I have to do to make up for my sins, but I just get to say, God, I confess them to you. And then He takes me. And he puts me back in that position of grace. He puts me back in that position of, of, of a right relationship with him where I was trying to, to, trying to shove away from him. But I ask you today that you would look at Orn and examine him. And there's so much more that can be drawn out from this scripture, but I say examine Orn and, and see. See if there might be a good example there for us. See, in the disobedience to God, we, we don't just bring judgment upon ourselves, but those around us. You look at this nation, and what are the preachers that they worship and adore? It's not the, it's not the preachers of the 17 and the 1800s who, who would stand in piles of sweat, their shoes filled with sweat, from preaching the gospel to the lost in the streets. It's not the ones that would stand out on the corner each night and have, and have prayer meetings until 12, 1, 2 in the morning. Those are wackos. Those people are nuts, man. They're just too crazy for Jesus. We want to get crazy for Jesus, but we only want it to be in church three hours a week or, or one hour a week. Who do they worship? They worship people like Benny Hinn, one who bears a false gospel. And you say, why is Benny Hinn there? Why is he there? You know what I think? I think Benny Hinn is judgment upon those people. Benny Hinn is the judgment that comes forth and says, this is what your hearts desire? I'm going to give it to you. You desire this? You want health, wealth, and prosperity? You don't want the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, I'm going to give you what you want. Here's your Benny Hinn. Here's your Joel Osteen. Here's your every way's all right. Took all these Christian colleges founded upon Christian principles and said, you know what? The people nowadays, they want evolution. They don't want God. They want, they want, uh, they want everything but God. Well, let's turn these colleges over to the atheists. And what have they done? They've done exactly that. That's the judgment of God I see upon this nation and upon other nations and upon other peoples. Time is getting short. In 2008, Barack Obama voted against same-sex marriage. Now he is the bastion, the champion of it. Times are only getting worse. And I ask you today, will you do as David and say, I'm going to press on in sin? I'm going to set out to sin? Or you do as Ornan and say, I give it all, Lord. You young people, you have a, an opportunity that I had and I squandered when I said, you know, God, I'm going to do my own thing for a few years. And the chastisement that I felt, the, the harm that it did to my soul, the harm that it did to me spiritually, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to say, you know, I, I, I'm going to just... Uh, 
I'm going to consume my life with Facebook and, and, and the internet and my cell phone. And, and you know, I, I guess I'll open the Bible up on Sundays. And then I'll close it for the rest of the week. It's not worth it to say, you know, my mom and dad, they've got so much zeal about it. And they're older, though, so they understand more. I'm just, I just, you know, I just sit back and watch them. And, and eventually, Lord, I'll really start serving you. Be in order and say, I give it all now. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to stay in disobedience. I, I, I'm going to continue in, in, what, in what the example has been set before me. Be an ornament. Step up and say, God, I, I give my life to you. I give it all. I ask you if you do that. You don't have to get up out of your seat. You don't have to come down here to the altar. You can sit there quietly just between you and God and say, God, I give it all. Not for my glory, but for the glory of Jesus Christ. Not for the, 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 the applaud of people in the church, not for the applaud of, of my friends or anything like that, but, but so that God, so that Jesus Christ might get glory. The reward for that. The precious things that will stand there at the judgment that you'll be able to present to Christ that will not burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. Be magnificent. <laughs> I thank you all for listening to me. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be with your word now. It's gone out. It will not return unto you void. I pray, God, that it would just echo in the hearts of these people here now. Let it echo in my heart that I would give it all. God, don't let me be stingy with my life. Don't let me keep this away in the corner. But let me give it all. God, I love you, and I praise your holy name. I thank you for the opportunity again. I pray you'd be with these people now. Lord, the heavy hearts that they might have. Maybe there's somebody in here tonight who's, who knows that they're living in a position where they're just setting out to sin daily. They've stopped praying. They've stopped reading their Bible. It's, it's so often uh, people who are young in the faith or, or not mature in the faith do. I pray, God, that you'd help them to see that there's a better way. God, that you'd rent their hearts, that they would, they, their walls that they've built up would be broken down through the convicting power of the Spirit and the chastisement that's there. God, draw them back. Lord, draw us all closer to you. I ask this in Christ's name for his sake. Amen. Amen.